Today's episode is brought to you by our friends over at the Crypto Academy. Just in the past year, the Crypto Academy has helped students launch new careers at over 75 of the leading Bitcoin, crypto, and NFT companies across the world. Their three-week intensive program is designed with some of the leading HR companies across some of the most competitive Bitcoin and crypto companies across the industry to ensure that you are learning the right material to get hired at the right job. If you are looking to transition into a new job in the Bitcoin or crypto industry, the Crypto Academy has you covered. Their next cohort begins October 1st, so make sure that you sign up at the link below. I'm very excited to partner with Pomp and the Crypto Academy to give away a $1,250 free course. The giveaway instructions are very simple. Make sure that you are subscribed to this channel, hit the notification bell, and comment on every podcast from today until October 4th with the hashtag The Crypto Academy. I'm excited for this partnership and I hope that you guys are too. Let's get on to the show. I can't tell you enough how excited I am for this conversation. Matt, Matt was sent and I were sitting here talking for about 10 minutes. It's like, all right, we have to hit the record button <laughs> before we talk about all the, right. good, all of the good stuff. <laughs> I, had, I had to get Matt on. Matt, if you don't know, is pretty much an NFT extraordinaire. Um, you cover, if I sit here and just list out everything he's done between DJ, podcaster, NFT collector, co-founder of NFT Now, and there's probably so much more. This man is full of knowledge, and I'm excited because he is a huge historical NFT fan. He's a big supporter, and with this, this small community, uh, having Matt's support has helped us grow substantially as well as the contents of this conversation we're going to hold. So Matt, thank you for joining us. Thank you, man. I've been following your podcast too. I love it because like, you know, you're, you're on it when it comes to historical NFT trends that haven't like hit the mainstream yet. And, you know, as a big believer in historical NFTs, like, thank you for what you do too. I, I appreciate it. Seriously, from the bottom of my heart. For those who don't know, there are some people in the historical NFT community who are just at the very depths, cross chain. Maybe they don't uh, hang out on ETH as much where you've been growing NFT now. Tell us a little bit about uh, NFT now and who Matt Medved is. Totally. Oh, man, where to start? Um, well, I'll start with Matt Medved because it came before NFT now. Um, but I'll make it real brief because I know we got a lot of good stuff to chat about. Um, so, you know, I uh, I come from the music and media space originally. Uh, actually, prior to that, I actually worked in nonprofits, uh, specifically conflict resolution. Um, I, I worked in Nigeria, Zimbabwe, but that's a whole previous lifestyle, uh, a whole previous uh, <laughs> lifetime ago, it feels like. Um, but I was while I was doing all that, I was also very active in the music space. And I, I come from a journalism background. I went to Northwestern for my undergraduate in Chicago um, and uh, then got hooked on on um, on traveling and and doing international coverage. I had the opportunity to work in South Africa um, and, and cover a lot of social issues. I spent um, two years uh, abroad after my undergraduate um, working teaching English in South Korea, uh, traveling all over Asia and also living in in uh, in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, and I actually pursued graduate school because I uh, wanted to make an impact beyond just writing about about issues. And uh, fast forward, I was doing joint law and master's degrees at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., uh, and spending all my time like, you know, like by day doing all that stuff. And by night, um, DJing clubs, writing about dance music for blogs, like, you know, getting to know the dance music space. It was really starting to, to like pop off in America during that time. Um, and I was finishing up the uh, those those uh, graduate programs as back to back exchange programs in Milan and Berlin uh, when I got the opportunity to write for Billboard and started doing all of Billboard's dance music coverage uh, as a freelancer living in Berlin, uh, covering festivals like Tomorrowland, Sonar, all the above, um, you know, wrote a feature on a kid named Kygo back when he had never played outside Norway. I was like, this kid's going to be the next <laughs> big thing. Did the whole rise with him and his team, did the whole rise like with Martin Garrix and all of these these big DJs, Alice in Wonderland, Black Coffee, saw the the opportunity to found Billboard Dance in 2015, um, built that brand. Uh, couldn't believe it didn't exist yet. Got to build that brand. Uh, and what was really interesting was during my time in Milan in 2013, that's when I first discovered Bitcoin and started dabbling. And again, I was a fresh student. You know, it's not like I had a lot of capital or anything, but I started to, you know, I kind of like got a little bit of skin in the game and thought the technology was really cool. Sent the Bitcoin primer to like all my friends. None of them listened to me. And, uh, and I remind them that every once in a while. Um, but, you know, Bought pretty much the top of that market in 2013, <laughs> crashed right after, but I held on to it just because I was like, you know what, I believe in the technology. Um, what was interesting was my time at Billboard coincided with the next bull run 
of 2016 to 2018. And what was really interesting was a lot of my friends who were DJs were also trading cryptocurrency, guys like Blau and RAC, and um, started doing coverage there because I realized I was the only person at Billboard who A, owned crypto or B, understood it at all, and um, was really interested at the intersection of music and blockchain. And, uh, you know, I did a bunch of panels with RAC at um, uh, South by Southwest. Uh, I advised for Blau's Music and Blockchain Festival back then. You know, we were very focused on like, how can this empower musicians? And it was just a little bit early. Like NFTs were kind of the missing puzzle piece then. And I know they existed then, as, as we know, with on-chain data, but like they weren't on my radar as like as a real mechanism for creating value for creators and artists yet. And so uh, after that, um, I ran Spin Magazine as editor-in-chief, um, exited with the sale of that uh, at the beginning of 2020, and then COVID hit. And I was actually running content at the lifestyle publisher uh, Modern Luxury uh, when Blau pulled me down the NFT rabbit hole. And I remember of this phone call with him, like crystal clear, um, all the light bulbs in my head were going off. And I was like, this was finally, it was like the technology that I'd believed in for a very long time, finally disrupting fields I'm actually passionate about like music, art, culture, and in a way that actually empowers creators. Um, because like at the end of the day, I'm not a finance guy. Like I don't get up excited about profit. We you know, we like profit, but like I don't, that's not what I, that doesn't motivate me. It's never motivated me in my career. Uh, I've always been motivated by finding the next big thing in music, in 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 art, in, in, in culture, supporting it and providing that platform to really uplift artistry. And so NFTs just made so much sense to me. Um, I went deep down the rabbit hole and, um, well, that was the, the era of NFT Clubhouse. So I was starting to really like be very active on NFT Clubhouse um, and uh, kind of building a bit of a, of a following there. And meanwhile, found uh, kind of we like was started the what was it? We founded the NFT Now social accounts on uh, Instagram and Twitter back in January 2021. Oh, man, and so um, long ago, so long ago. I'm just like, wow, that was a different era. Um, and uh, they just started growing. And like really started to take off my co-founders, Alejandro and Sam realized that we had an opportunity to solve a problem that we faced when we entered the space, which was a lack of really credible, uh, a credible source, like a number one trusted source in the space. Like when, when we entered NFTs, it was a lot of like platforms with megaphones promoting their own drops and like these talking head influencers on Twitter, like shilling their own bags. And I was like, where is the billboard of the NFT space? Like, where's the complex? Like, where's that? It didn't exist yet. And so we are like, well, let's build it with NFT now. Um, and the last thing we want NFT now to be is a traditional media company covering NFTs. Um, a lot of what we've been building, you know, publicly at least has been very much uh, on that web two, web 2.5 area, um, mostly because we want to meet the masses where they are. Um, the mission with NFT now is to empower the creators of culture and to help drive mainstream adoption of NFTs. So it's very important to us that we're not just preaching to the choir. Like we want to convert the masses. We want to bring new people in. Um, and so that's why it's important that NFT now be really active on the Instagrams and the Twitters and the YouTubes and the like. But we actually are building some really interesting and exciting infrastructure um, around the future of Web3 Media, which I can't go into detail right now, but uh, some stuff I'm really excited about. And uh, we'll be, uh, yeah, there'll be some announcements in, in the next, in you know, later this year. But um, it, it's been a, an amazing journey. Uh, NFT now is now a team of 15 full time. And one thing I know you mentioned, you know, ETH, definitely the lion's share of our coverage has been on, on ETH, um, just because, you know, that's where so much of this of the market volume has been. But NFT now is chain agnostic, you know, like we, um, we've done coverage around salon NFTs on Tezos, um, we've done some coverage of historical NFTs on, on other blockchains, I've spent many a late night burning the midnight oil, like delving into into said into said block. <laughs> blockchains um so we, we're definitely here like as we want to be here as like that like that even handed we're, i always say we're like the switzerland of the space you know like <laughs> we're neutral like we 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 will partner with with you know we'll partner with christie's on something we'll partner with sotheby's on something we'll we'll you know we're, we don't play favorites in that way like and we're here kind of for everyone um and so uh it, it has been really uh exciting uh to see what we kind of were always confident would be the case start to really be the case which was that nfts are so much bigger than a category it's a medium on which all of the categories are going to uh find ways to redefine how creators and communities create and share value together um we always like 
kind of considered that NFTs would be an ocean. Some people questioned whether they're like, oh, you're just going to cover NFTs. Like, what about crypto? What about DeFi? And I was like, just NFTs. Like, we're not even going to like, like, NFTs are going to have the same depth and breadth of like all of these categories prior to Web3 plus more. Um, we're, like, we're, we're going to have our work cut out for us just being on top of NFTs. And it's been really gratifying to kind of see um, the growth and um, the evolution of so many different use cases. Um, so that was a, a long answer. That was to quite your, beautiful, my your, friend. Quite beautiful. Question. <laughs> quite beautiful. I mean, uh, to dissect that a little bit. First, I didn't know that you're a part of uh, Billboard Dance. Uh, I, yeah. as growing up in baby. Vegas, I was going to EDC since 2010, 2011, and a big raver kid across the world. So that I was very familiar with that and spinning records, which is which amazing. Is, which is cool. I remember when Blau launched. I think it was our music festival. Is that what it was? Yeah. Right. Yeah, That's what it was, was called back I, in the day. That was the one I uh, advised on. Yeah. yeah. OMF. And, and following in your guys' footsteps, I, I, there's a lot, of things, a lot of things that you're doing specifically that I'm trying to implement out here in Las Vegas with the, I think you're, you're big on music NFTs. I think entertainment and hospitality NFTs are having a bright future. And so those kind of like follow, it's all very gradual, um, which is cool. And also, uh, before we go into historical NFTs, I'm glad that you guys cover cross-chain NFTs. I just yeah. had on the uh, the founder of Creatures who did the first NFT project on Solana. And it was, oh, it was interesting to hear his perspective and like the growing pains that they had on Solana, which was a lot of the like pre-ERC721 creators um, on ETH, where there's no standards that were created, um, trying to decide like the first series since it's the first gen one series on solana what's the value there and how to see collectors and it's very similar across all these change it's just the technology um improves in all of them so it is it is quite quite interesting so uh, i'm glad that that you guys are doing that yeah absolutely and uh you know it, it's i'm actually a big collector on tezos um just i love the art community there um so i like i probably have you know like cl close to like a thousand nfts on tezos now um <laughs> you know what i mean like i just and it's it's fun for me and you know like i i also like i've dabbled with solana nfts i've like went deep on name coin you know what i mean mm -hmm. like I've, I've spent some time like, like i explored like a little bit of emmer coin um you know uh doge party, party like yeah. i've been i've been i've been getting like i've been delving you know what i mean like i i love i love like these sort of like i, I love these other blockchains just because um you know, there's a lot of secrets to discover and it's all like the beauty of the of blockchain is that it's, it's all kind of like hidden in plain sight. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Um, it's all, it's all there and it can't be tampered with. It can't be changed. It can't be like, you know, and, and, and it's, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, as someone who loves history, it's definitely, uh, it, it, it just, you know, it has always fascinated me. So I'm, I'm, I'm constantly like <laughs> doing these crazy deep dives. Yeah, like, you're, the, those... you're, you're the only founder that I've seen posting, uh, posting your doge party wallet under like free, free, like free mints from, uh, from the dog fathers putting stuff out. I'm like, there's nobody else That's with right. that big of account who's really diving in with the community. <laughs> yeah, <people laughs> like what's going on? Here? Like, Yo, I love, I love doge party, man. I'm telling, I, I still think like people are sleeping on it. You know yeah. what I mean? One thing, it's, one, it's, one, one thing that's super interesting about NFTs and maybe, maybe you can agree or think about this is that NFTs are largely, um, there, you know, there's a lot of fiscal capital that's tied in, but there's a lot of social capital. So if you can find the right NFTs across the chains, they, if, if it's the top social capital token on one chain, it'll scale across chains and uh, it brings that kind of clout with it, right? So if you own like the relics on Namecoin and on Doge Party and on Solana, yeah. eventually they're, they're all going to be tokenized on one chain and right between Emblem Vault where you can vault it across chain. It's like wearing different brands in different countries and then taking that brand to that country. That's kind of like how I see it now in, in the early stages. So it just scales much better than trying to uh, buy the different layer one tokens because once you get into DeFi and intellectual capital, that's kind of what I see it over there. Um, they're all running everything uh, very, uh, qu quantitatively and not as qualitatively. Yeah. And it's kind of like, it's that fun factor of like discovery. It's kind of like that. If you know, you know, thing, you know, and like, it were all, all like, I think the, what, what I love about the historical NFT space is like, it's very like open, like very welcoming in a sense. Like it's all about open arms, all about spreading the word, but there is like that, like that core, you mm. know, like I like people were definitely like, Whoa, when I started like, <laughs> put, like tweeting about Doge party stuff, but I was like, hell yeah. Like, like I just like, it, to me, it's just really fascinating. And, um, the social capital is like, the, you're like you're just spot on about that. Um, but you know what? It, it's to me, it's like, you know, what's funny, like 
my mom is a huge like fan of estate sales and like and 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 garage sales and like she's always like the tr- treasure hunting like growing up and i never really got it until nfts do you know yeah, what i mean yeah. and now i'm just like i get it now i get it now because like there's all these there's all these like incredible opportunities like hidden in plain sight and like being able to like you know like i, I have friends for example who are just like holy shit like you know, everything's relative, right? Because like I got into NFTs at really got into NFTs, even though I'd been in crypto, I really got into NFTs in like fall of 2020. Right. And, you know, I, I got my crypto punk in March, 2021. Um, and, you know, like to me, I'm just like, Oh, okay. But like, I didn't feel early at the time, but like to my friends who got in, in, you know, January mm, yeah. of this year, they're like, wow. You know, like it like, they wish they'd had an opportunity to buy a crypto punk, right? Things like that. Um, and to me, like one of the reasons why I love crypto punks is because I really think they like embody that ethos of discovery and, and innovation in the space. Like the fact that they were created without a financial calculus, the fact that they were created as an experiment and given away for free, like that, like that can't be mimicked anymore, really. I mean, it can be mimicked, but it can't like, like that, that era of like, you know, it, it was a moment in time. And to me, it's a piece of, piece of internet history. And to me, and to me, the social capital is less about like, it's worth this much, as much as it is, this is a piece of internet history. And like, one thing I thought G money said, like really uh, like astutely, he actually, um, when we did our, like our NFT now guide to crypto punks, um, he actually was like a guest expert, kind of like provide some quotes. And he said like, look, either if you own a crypto punk, either you were there, like early days of Ethereum, or you believed in it enough to buy in and like, and, and about that ethos and like what that represents. And that kind of stuck with me. I was just like, it is a way of signaling. And to me, like, I know that they've become, you know, obviously like, you know, because of the price appreciation and everything, there is the financial side, but like, you know, like to me, like whether, no matter what a CryptoPunks price is, like it's social capital is secure in my eyes because it's it's like this piece of internet history and i think that that can be said for a lot of these other less um perhaps like these these uh these other collections and projects and things that are perhaps like you know don't have the same mainstream awareness but are no less significant in what they represent to their communities and also what they'll represent um when we look back in five years, oh, 10 man, years, 15 years, 50 years, I'm cause I'm always thinking long-term I'm mm-hmm. a long-term thinker, you know, like I'm not a trader. I'm, I'm actually not great. I'm not good at trading, but, but yeah, I do I mean, think yeah. I have an eye for, for long, for like what will be significant in the long term. So then th- this is, uh, this this kind of idea is what a lot of the historical NFT uh, community members can form around is this idea that the modern NFTs of we'll just say 2021 and beyond is it's a flipper's paradise, right? People are coming in. There's a lot of alpha groups that are just trying to extract prop. Pro- extract profit where the historical NFT community is more of a collector base. People are just looking very much in the long term, And so because of this, I don't know if it's just because right now NFTs from the financial perspective are just driven by speculation and mania and liquidity, but most of most, per- most people in the NFT space overlook NFTs because they are collectors and you know, they're the collectors are going for that 1000, 10,000 X premium over the long term instead of, you know, buying, an NFT and then immediately relisting it later. So what is it from your perspective that brings you over to the historical NFT community? Is it, is it because you're not a trader, right? This is kind of like what the Bitcoin maximalists say, right? They, they're Bitcoin maxis because they, they've got wrecked on all kinds of shit coins. <laughs> is, it, is it something about um, you as a person trying to understand history? And, uh, and then after dissecting that, uh, where do you think the, the NFT community, how do you think the NFT community can break that mold to bring in some, some of the other, uh, speculators? It's a really good question. Um, you know, for myself, I've always been like a student of history. Like I've always loved history. Those were my favorite like classes growing up, uh, when I was navigating the music world, like I'm like a music history buff, you know what I mean? And even my, my dad, my dad is a, he's a brain doctor. He's a neurologist. There's nothing to do with music, but he's a huge music fan. And so he raised me on the Beatles, Stones, Doors, Pink Floyd, like the classics. And he's actually a collector of like rare music memorabilia. And he actually owns some like rare Beatles pieces and things like that. And so like the idea of collectability around music and history has always made sense to me. I literally was raised with it, um, you know? And so that that always like really resonated with me. Um, and so what's interesting is um, 
when when I entered the NFT space, a lot of people expected me to just be like all about music NFTs. And I, I love music NFTs. I'm a big believer in them. I, th I think that music NFTs have the potential to really, um, you know, empower uh artists and creatives who have been stuck within like a totally bullshit system for so long with the major labels and the street and like mm -hmm. now like the streaming services like i'm incredibly excited about what the trend the technology can do for musicians but in the spirit of learning and in discovery i was like i was really drawn to the historical side of the nft space especially medium native culture which has always just interested me in general um and you know i loved learning about like the like the early days on super rare, like the early crypto artists, the first ever um, NFT now substack that I wrote uh, back when it was a substack and not a website um, was like 10 crypto art OGs you need to know. And it was like, I was just like super down the rabbit hole on X copy and like the Sarah Zuckers and the Coldies and just like the Hackatows and like, I did like the Robbie Barrett's. And I just like, I was like, this is so interesting to me because it, I'm learning really new things. It's an area I wasn't that familiar, like I didn't know that much about. I've always had an appreciation for art, but I didn't necessarily feel like I had a finger on the pulse of it, which I felt like I did when it came to crypto art because of like the medium native nature of it. And uh, I also felt like um, the fact that the very nature of the blockchain makes it so interesting to delve into the history of these things because it's all out there. It's there. You can literally see. You can go to the ether. You can go to EtherScan and see when Art Gnome like convinced mm -hmm. Robbie Barrett to finally like mint like AI generated nude number one. You know what I mean? And like you can go see that, and that's so cool to me. And um, I I just I found that really fascinating. Uh, and you know, coming from the crypto space, I've always had a long term outlook. You know, as I said, I, I bought Bitcoin in 2013, uh, really dick dabbling, um, and I still haven't sold it. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, I actually joke, it's like, I actually haven't really up until, I, I mean, not really still, I haven't really sold crypto for US dollar ever. You wow. know, I got some stable coins and the like, but like, doesn't mean I didn't make some questionable altcoin decisions in uh, 2017. <laughs> doesn't mean I'm not highly illiquid in JPEGs right now. But like, <laughs> I, I, like I, and I, that's, don't get me wrong. Doesn't mean I haven't like taken profits, but like, I generally have just kept that all in the ecosystem because at the end of the day, I also, you know, I, this, and until NFTs, I wasn't working full time in crypto or web three, all that. Um, so I was always earning a fiat salary, things like that. Like, so to me, I was like, well, I really believe in the future of this space. Why, why would I take it out? Like, I'd rather it be, have the upside and like have the exposure to that because I just really believe in it long term. Uh, it's like my, my, everything I've done in crypto has never been about like short term. It's always been long term. And so again, I'm, I, I'm not a, like a finance guy, but I can spot talent. You know what I mean? Like, for, like that was always my hallmark, um, at billboard, you know, like it's been, I was early to so many of these artists. Um, you know, just, I just, and it was just so obvious to me that like, this kid is going to be a star. And it was the same feeling I felt when I first interviewed Fuocious in February, 2021, it was his first ever interview. Uh, it was so wow. funny because we got on zoom and I started like asking about things and he was like, he's like, how, how do you know about me? And I was like, I did my research. This is what we do for interviews. He's like, whoa. He's like, that's never happened to me before. It was so cute. And I, and I love, I love Fio and I'm so proud of him and all this success. And I think he's just absolutely an incredible artist and he's become a good friend. But like, to me, it was just like, it was so plainly obvious. I was like, this kid is going to be a star and to be the, the ability to be able to like, you know, play a more active role in that too. Like I can be a collector. I can be a, you know, like I, it, it's not just about like, you know, the, um, be able to provide that platform. It's about also being able to share in the value that you can create. And like when you, when you call a shot. And so like just those, those factors together, um, like knowing that, like I have an eye for things, be having a long-term out, uh, outlook, being fascinated by history, just made historical NFTs like such a, like so interesting to me because it was really like, you know, it was, it, it, it you know, it, it's like, to me, it was like, it was the, the frontier of which, uh, I knew, I knew the least about, but was so interested in learning more about. And so I became like, went full down the rabbit hole. You know, I read every single, uh, article on art gnome site, shout out to art gnome. You know, he was, he's been chronicling this for a long time. Um, and, uh, I, you know, just started really like researching and, I really enjoyed doing that. Like I, I genuinely really just enjoy it. Um, and 
I think to me, uh, the thing is like, not everybody's like that and that's okay. Like I, I, I tell people like, it's funny, like NFTs are still, the way we know NFTs are still so nascent is that um, people expect people expect uh, everyone to have the same like creative and consumer priorities across the board. And I'm like, I'm like, guys, like, you know, the people who are going to a casino and like pulling the slot machines and all that, uh, they're not, they're not, those are not the same people who go to Sotheby's to buy fine art. Those are not the same people who go to like, you know, research like obscure pieces of writings or like history or, or, or PhD history students, you know what I mean? Like, and, and that's okay. That's okay. Like, I'm not judgmental. Like the speculators, they got to do their thing. And they actually play an important part in the, in the market and the ecosystem because they, they provide liquidity and like, you know, for better or for worse in their case, like, but it, it's, it's an important part of it. Um, and look, like whenever you have these, these, the, this kind of volatility and speculative assets, it draws speculators, look at the crypto space, you know? And, and so it didn't necessarily surprise me to see that happen with NFTs. Um, and, you know, it, to me, it's like, uh, I I don't like look down on it in any way, but I also just know, I know where my strengths lie. You know, I did try actually, it's a good question you asked. Like I did try and, and uh, trade crypto in like not day trade, but like I tried to actively trade it in the 2016, 2018, you know, like bull market. Um, I had some wins, I had some losses. And I eventually like after like hours of pouring over charts and like trying to teach like, yeah. technical analysis, like all these things. And like, you know, and of course like the emotional roller coaster that like living your life according to volatile charts like takes you on. Um, I did the math and I would have come out, I literally would have come out slightly ahead if I just kept it all in Bitcoin and ETH. And that, and that was something that really spoke to me. I was like, okay, I'm not a trader. Uh, it's all about finding long-term things to believe in. And, and if you believe in the future of the space, which I do, um, you know, now's an opportunity. Like a, now there's a window to acquire these, his, these pieces of historical note. Um, while at a time when it's still, the market penetration is still so small, the people don't really, the, you know, the, the general awareness and education is still quite nascent. Uh, and so like, you know, it's, it's a, almost a generational opportunity Honestly, like a you know, like if, if you really do believe that we are at the dawn of a new chapter in art history, if we're at the dawn of a new chapter in internet history, creative history, like it, it, to me, it's like it's just very natural to think about what are the pieces now that are going to be in museums in fifty years. You know, like to me, crypto punk, I was like that makes so much sense to me. You know, like uh, curio cards, things like that makes so much sense to me. You know, and it's like when and so my that 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 kind of is it's that mindset that kind of like fuels my perspective on the space um and i think as people as people enter and as we continue to see all these categories grow people will understand that there's so much more to nfts than simply speculative investments speculative assets uh and we will also see that like different categories whether it's digital art, digital, you know, like digital collectibles, music, uh, photography, TV, film, you know, literary NFTs, uh, more mundane use cases like deeds for your house, all these things, a real estate, like, you know, soul bound tokens that are, they have different creative and consumer priorities at play, just like they do in the real world. And, you know, like, and, and that's okay. That's okay. And so not everyone will expect a speculative, you know, return on, on everything they invest in. People will support artists purely to support artists. That's what I do on Tezos because, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, I can afford to do it there. Yeah. The Tez, know, Tez like, trash movement has been picking up. Been exactly. I've been having fun with that. I own most of Rob Ness's pieces there. And that's because a, it's like super affordable. To, to buy on Tezos and be like, you know, he's an artist with historical note. And, um, and I think that like, for me, um, it's, it's, it's just something I, I love because it's just, uh, being able to collect from a place, uh, of pure appreciation and without the ROI financial calculus, um, it, it just like, it, I, I've talked to Artno about this. Like, I feel like collecting on Tezos now feels like what it must've felt like it's the closest to what it must have felt like to like collecting on super rare in the early days, you know, like when nobody expected necessarily like X copy to be selling for seven figures or things like that. It was all about just like supporting artists and exploring this new technology and like building these kind of nascent communities. And, um, you know, and, and I think that's really special and, you know, and, and that's what, that's also a reason why historical NFTs speak to me is that a lot of them were made. I, I, I mentioned this with CryptoPunks, but a lot of them were made at a time that was just 
more innocent mm -hmm. and genuine than 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 it is now. Yeah, c culture really persists in the absence of wealth, and then once once capitalism comes in, they tend to uh, like depreciate the culture um, through different ways of of capital extraction. It is. It's, it's really quite unique. Um, but now that you've mentioned and, and you've shown that, you know, the, the historical community is more of a collector base, the, the modern NFT is more, uh, I don't know, experimentation, capital extraction, whatever you want to call it with the derivatives. When you really dive down the, the historical NFT community uh, and start looking across all these chains, you realize that the, 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 the contention in the communities uh, kind of circles around like ideology and semantics, right? The meaning of what a token is, how long, how, how long it's existed, is the timestamp more important? Is the registry more important, uh, right? The idea of like fungibility versus semi-fungibility. Um, it's sometimes it, it makes it difficult to understand like what are, what are the valuable pieces and, and when aren't, was there, so is when you're looking between, we'll just go through the main ones, name coin, yeah. uh, counterparty, doge party, emmer coin, was there any, anything that caught your attention in terms of like the progression of technology that helps you, um, perv helps you come to a conclusion of some sort of like con collection thesis? It's a really good question. Um, to me, I'm I'm not really the, the kind of guy who likes to just like draw lines in sand and be like, this is fungibility, this is an NFT, this isn't. I find it fascinating to see like the debates uh, and, and like the sources being cited and the like. But I think like we can all appreciate the fact that like this all comes from the, the place of discovery and like pushing this frontier forward. So like whether you believe that like a dot bit like name coin domain is truly a quote unquote NFT, I still think it's significant. I still think it's significant in this narrative, in this story, in in everything. Um, and so it, it's up to us to determine whether that significance equates to value. But like, to me, it's like, rather than trying to define like what is and what isn't an NFT, I think it's about a, appreci like appreciating everything in their own context and in their own frames. Um, you know, I always tell people, I'm like, you know, like when, especially when I'm educating people about NFTs and stuff, like a lot of them are like, oh, are CryptoPunks the first NFT? I'm like, no, CryptoPunks are not the first NFT, but they are certainly one of the most influential if not the most influential and i think that's fair to say mm -hmm. and you know like so it's like i'm i'm less concerned about like who is technically first although i think it's cool to find that out you know what i mean but it's like it, it it's also about like significance and influence and i think like just being old isn't enough always that said I still think it's interesting. I still think it's fascinating. Like the discovery of Puni codes was so interesting to me, you know, like to like early, like early, like attempts at art, like art or like visual elements on the blockchain. You know, you can like split hairs as to like, is that an NFT? Is it not? I don't, I don't, I'm not going to be the one to say yes or no. I think it's cool. I think it's great. And ultimately like, I always say like we as a society have to determine where value lies and clearly like the markets have spoken to a certain degree that puny codes do have value. And I think yeah. that's cool. You know, I have a 2012 one and I'm just holding on to that. You know what I mean? Because I think it's awesome. And I think it's like, it's just a piece of similar to like with, with the crypto punk, it's a, it, to me, it's a piece of internet history and whether that's worth a lot one day or it's worth nothing one day, it's still significant to me. You know what I mean? And, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm a believer that like, I'm a believer that in the thesis, you know, I know uh, the NFT archaeologists have done a good job of like articulating this white rabbits as that great article, you know, all, you know, Adam and, and, and Leonidas have, have, have done great jobs. Um, but, you know, in kind of in helping spread the word and, and understanding of like the timeline and all that. But like, I'm a big believer that in that, that we are like, you know, that window of where, you know, prior to 2020 or 2021 or wherever you want to do it, like prior to this boom in mainstream awareness, will be a very special window and that the cap is numbered the cap is already limited and uh as we continue to see nfts grow um and and the numbers continue to grow they will be an increasingly small and scarce uh percentage of that pie and i think that's significant and i think the ones that have real significance are going to appreciate in value but ultimately it comes down to storytelling and understanding and people you know like at the end of the day uh it it, it always comes down to that you know like whenever I'm, I'm bringing new people into the nft space and helping people especially like helping like older people wrap their heads around it i always talk about rare baseball cards 
Yep. Uh, and I, I make the analogy because, you know, longer than you or I have been alive, our society has accepted that rare baseball cards have value. It's a piece of cardstock. It's literally a piece of cardstock. It costs less than five cents to make, but a 1950s rookie, rookie Mickey Mantle one sold for 5.2 million. Why is that? It's not about the cardstock. It's about what it represents, the history, the scarcity, the cultural relevance, the fandom, like the rarity. It's it's those narratives that that it's it, that, it's that story that, that gets us excited, um, and and that makes these things these histor- you know these things have value. It's the same thing with NFTs, and um, so it'll be really interesting to see. Uh, and I, I try not to get caught up in like the contentious side. Like one thing that I really like is I like to see how I like it when I see historical NFT projects, like doing spaces together, uh, doing collabs together. Like I loved it when I got the like crypto skull mask for my moon cat. Like yes. that, was a, that was a dope moment, you know, like, uh, I saw the curio card thing. I thought that was super cool. Um, you know, like, you know, like I like it because at the end of the day, we all, if you really believe in the space and you believe in historical NFTs, we all have a vested interest in people having a better understanding of where they, where everything came from so they can appreciate where we're going. And, and I think that like, I'm a big believer that when, like, when, when, uh, you know, when the tide rises, so do all the ships. And so, um, I'd, I'd like to see, I like to see the, the NFT, the historical NFT community, um, like supporting each other. And, um, again, as I said, I'm, I'm like less concerned about being like, this is the first NFT. No, this is the first, like, cool. They're both early examples of scarcity, fungibility, and cultural significance on the blockchain. It comes back to like, it comes back to cultural significance yep. to me yep. because like, you know, and, and I think we're one thing that's gonna be really fascinating is like, you know, uh, it, it we're still a little bit like nascent to really see it. But like, I also think like people are, are not, are kind of sleeping on like the power of provenance. Uh, as we look back on history, like imagine if you had uh, an NFT that like you could prove that Vitalik owned like that, that's going to have, that's going to be valuable. Just like, you know, uh, a personal belonging of like George Washington or Thomas Edison, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it, it, yeah, it, that's so, it's so unique on, on Namecoin specifically, you can have that proof where uh, yeah. some of, some of the, some of the Twitter eggs and blockheads and images that were minted through one name were minted through like Vitalik himself and through yeah. the Winklevoss twins and a handful of like, I Love that Bitcoin stuff. OGs and some people yep. some people think you know these are meaningless right is it a token it expires whatever but it shows that these early pioneers were there experimenting and for some people that's a lot of value if you idolize the Winklevoss twins or yeah. Vitalik you want that piece of history yeah and like at the end of the day like your average fan your average no, I don't even want to say fan like like the average like you know potential like consumer it honestly pr- is not going to want to split hairs about like the technical nature of like is renewing a dot bit actually creating a new like you know it's like this is a this is a this is a historical domain this is the one person who owns it i i think it I, to me it, it's clear that it has cultural and historical significance um what we can't do is get like I think, uh, like, let me just say this, like, I think the fact that we can get so technical is really important and amazing because it allows us to root out, like, uh, projects that are that are not historical, masquerading as historical. Uh, the fact that, that, like, the receipts are all there on the blockchain is a great thing. But at the end of the day, like, you know, I, I, I don't think that, like, uh, we, we need to be careful not to become overly obsessed with the technical yes. side and and miss like the forest for the trees on just what is culturally significant, you know? Um, and, and I think that that's really special. Um, and, you know, I, I think that like, you know, we will look back and we will look back at, 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 at this period. And, uh, it's going to be really interesting to see like, which, which, uh, w- what's gone according to our expectations and what hasn't. Yeah, it, it's quite beautiful. I was in a Twitter space the other day, actually through uh, NFT Now Twitter Spaces with with Leo Adam and White Rabbit, oh, and we and we were talking about um, kind of what's what's the next stage for historical NFT community. And I've been kind of watching or um, studying the CryptoPunks culture because they they have now almost five years of a culture that's been intact. And I said, like the historical community, now we've discovered most of the projects. Yes, some some are popping up here and there, but 95% of the projects that have been created have been tapped into, and now there's a community behind it. And now the communities need to find how to work together, but then find yeah. something that we can all build around, right? Whether it's a yeah. marketplace or a website or a, a media company like there's something that the community needs to then form around and that was kind of like what reminded me of of crypto punks and why they became so popular is right the people found crypto punks they claimed it for free and um and then over time they started uh 
I, you could call it manipulating or whatever on uh, on Rarible, right, to increase the price or whatever happened there. And then a lot of those, after, a lot of people part of that community for two, three years, then went on to build their own projects. And then yep. that redirected uh, attention back to CryptoPunks, right? Like, uh, uh, the guy who created uh, Art Blocks, I forget what his name is. Uh, Snowfro. Uh, Snowfro. Yeah, he's an original. He, he, yeah, right. he's he's an original uh, punk guy, and uh, and Alex Gosman who create who created NFTX, and a lot of these mm -hmm. different people who are just like OG pioneers, and it redirects attention. So we try to like talk now as a community to not split hairs on the the technical definitions. Maximalism dri tends to drive away people than it does to uh, keep the the value intact, which which is really unfortunate. How, how do you think? You mentioned that it was cool to see the historical NFT yeah. communities working together. Is there anything from your perspective of having just like a complete knowledge of what's happening in the NFT space that you would like to see the historical NFT communities do to to grow mm -hmm. the over to grow the overall industry? That's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I think the first like to, to me, it always comes back to education because uh, you know. We, we are still very early when it comes to market penetration. So many people don't really even understand what an NFT is, let alone understand, like what understand that like that there are there's even a thing historical NFTs, you know? And that was one of the things that like I kind of was was really happy to see with like the rise of crypto skulls is that it just got more attention on the concept of historical NFTs at a time when there were so many newcomers in the space, you know, like NFTs weren't created yesterday, right? Like that's important to know. And there were a lot of people who genuinely did not know that. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. there are genuinely people who did not know that it's easy. It's easy because we're so down the rabbit hole and we're so in this day to day to forget that um, and to make assumptions. And so to me, like education is so key. We can't assume that people already understand this. We can't assume that people, uh, you know, are, are researching these things on their own. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one of the reasons why, like, I really was like welcoming to seeing like, you know, joint Twitters, you know, Twitter spaces and stuff. It's why it's why we gave, um, you know, that started the NFT history space with uh, with with Adam and, and and White Rabbit and Leo. And like, you know, just I think that that's really critical. I think that right now, um, education and awareness is like the biggest thing, because that's the biggest thing for NFTs at large as well. And then you get to like a much like smaller sect of people who are even in NFTs and are interested in this, um, making sure they know about it, you know, and so whether that is a marketplace, that's a really interesting thing. I actually hadn't thought about that like previously, but that could be really interesting. I mean, you think about how the CryptoPunks having their own marketplace, you know, really kind of like set them apart from, from any of the other projects um, and also created like a very loyal, like kind of community, but also like trading, like trading uh, space around mm -hmm. that as well. You know, the fact that there were you know, no gas fees and, and all that. And like, you know, it was, it was, uh, well, not get, excuse me, not no gas fees, no transaction no, fees, no, no transaction fees. Exactly. No transaction fees. Um, you know, that, that, that like, it, it gave people like a central point to rally around. And so maybe it is, maybe it is a historical NFT marketplace. Um, you know, uh, if I saw, I, I know you mentioned that that's something people are talking about. If I saw that, uh, you know, if I saw that rise, you know, I would, I would welcome that if it were done in a, in a way that also promoted education and awareness mm -hmm. about the projects that were there. You know what I mean? Because then it's like, Oh, maybe someone gets drawn in by, um, you know, uh, a crypto skulls or, you know, like a, a historical project that, that is having a moment in the, in the, in the limelight. And then, and then they go there for that. And then all of a sudden they're discovering crypto bots. All of a sudden they're discovering moon cats. They're discovering, you know, curio cards, things like that. One thing kind of leads to the other. And, um, you know, that, that, like that, that, that sense of like treasure hunting, like it can be really special. Um, I mean, I can tell you just from a, my own anecdotal side, like, um, you know, I started collecting on Tezos when it was Hiketnunk and that, that site was like purposely had terrible UX like on purpose. And like when it, when object launched, my Tezos collection went like through the roof because it just made it so much easier. There was a central point for me to be able to go and like see and navigate that. And, um, and so maybe that's, that, that, that's something that would actually, you know, bring more people in and, and bring people together, especially like you, if a, if you couldn't, bridge the like chain gap you know emblem vault has yeah. been a really like key thing there um and 
Uh, but I think like there's still obviously like it's still not ideal, right? There's still a lot of a lot of uh, you know room for improvement. But um, just being able to have like Doge Party assets on searchable on OpenSea instead of being like, well, you have to download like the Doge <laughs> wallet. Like, I mean, I I've got the Doge wallet. You know what I mean? Like I got like people are like, what are all those like things at the bottom of your scope? You're like you know, you're, you're back. I'm like there's name coin, Doge wallet, like all you know Counterparty, all that jazz. But like you, you know, I'm the exception. I'm not the we're the exception. Mm-hmm. We're not the rule. It's important to remember that. This is something I remember. I had to. I had to remember in music too. Do you know? Um. You know. Uh. I remember talking to the head of Amazon Music. Do you know what the most the most commonly asked query is on Amazon Music? Oh boy, I don't know. It's Alexa. Please play music. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like people, like we, we like, and I'm a music fan. So I'm like all over the place. I'm like, could be like country. Is this like, 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 you know, like I'm all, I'm in it. I'm an enthusiast, but most people, they just want a little like soundtrack. They just want, they just want a backtrack. We remember like a lot of people want decisions made for them. They like, if they're not an enthusiast, they're not seeking these things out in the same way that we are. Um, and that's okay. But it's important to remember that it's important to remember that. And once you remember that you realize that like, so like so many fewer people understand the space than we do so many fewer pe- people who even like understand nfts or are in it understand the, the the nature or the value in historical nfts um and and we uh have to carry that message forward and we have to be the ones you know it it's like uh if you think about it like it's the same same reason as like you know we learned history growing up uh it's because if 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 the people who came before didn't teach us that who would. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's like a really critical part of it. Um, and you know, and, and I, I, I'm like, I'm optimistic about it because it was interesting. This is like, like, it, this was a really cool moment. So like, um, I spoke at the Christie's art and tech summit in New York, uh, last week. And, um, at the there was a dinner afterwards like at the met which was crazy we were like literally like it's like dinner in the like egyptian area oh like there's like an old like mausoleum temple over here i'm like walking by like mummies and stuff and i got seated next to um the head like the christie's like specialist for historical documents wow and i was like ooh, <laughs> like like i we, we nerded out about everything but i was just like so fascinated to hear about how that how that like market works and i was like and it, and it challenged some of my expectations. I, he was like, "Oh, you know, I can get you like a, I can get you a George Washington signature for just like a couple thousand dollars. Like, be able one or like one or two thousand. Like, really? And he's like, "Yeah." He's like, "Because there's a lot of supply of those. You know, like George Washington was a prolific president. He had to, you know, and, and there's a lot. And he's like, what really matters is like, like documents of note of significance. He's like, he's like." You know, you want just like a, you know, he signed, you know, he, he would sign it for like for like soldiers in the army, like, you know, just like to sign off on like them getting whatever. Like he's like those things, you know, you can get them relatively cheap. There's a lot of them. He's like, but like, you know, Washington's correspondence about like a, you know, very pivotal moment in American history. That's, you know, priceless. That's through the roof. And that got me thinking, made me realize again, like being old is not like, mm-hmm. you know, is not necessarily just enough being like being like you know it, it even if just from one person supply size is like a thing and like it, it it was just so interesting to think about these like how the historical document space could like you know like what would be different and similar in the mm-hmm. in the nft in its nft side and i think some things are going to be more similar than we think at the end of the day like it it it's really about like storytelling and narratives and like you know why was this significant why was this important and that's incumbent on all of us to make sure that newcomers understand not simply because we want these things to have value it's simply because like this is what paved the way for everything and uh that that should matter yeah it, it, evaluating and, and discussing significance is is quite fascinating and the in the community we've kind of put into two buckets and there's probably a few where there's historical significance and then there's cultural significance mm. when i had first bought uh, my twitter egg which is uh probably the cultural hotspot of the name coin collections that's yeah. where that's where all the minds tend to gravitate around you have a bunch of big collectors i i kind of did this on every chain and i said okay if i'm gonna buy an egg on name coin what is the cultural significant spot of historical on each chain and obviously punks on eth and then yeah. you go to rare pepes on on a counterparty and then yeah. when you go in either direction either 
towards the the present or towards the past that's where it gets like more risk on until you get more entrance into the space mm -hmm. and i find it kind of interesting now when you look at a counterparty if you follow like the fake rares movement yeah. where just because of the association two rare Pepe's where you're getting some of the original artists coming in and making new copies or then getting some of the modern artists, you know, like yeah. Jake, the DJ and all these different people coming in. Some of those are actually, uh, selling for higher than a lot of the different rare Pepe's just because of the, the close cultural association to it. It's, yeah. I think we're going to see a lot more of that in the future too. One thing that was really interesting that the specialist told me, um, his name's Peter, by the way. Uh, and, and it was that like, especially when it comes to like culture, music, things like that. He was like, generational memory is also a big thing. Like he was like, he's like, like cause I was talking to him, I was asking him about like some of the Beatles, you know, pieces my dad's and like, just out of curiosity. And he was like, look, he's like, I think the Beatles are very like cross cutting. Like they're going to have a lot of staying power, but he was like, but there are definitely like, you know, there are some musicians who like their, their time of peak, like recognition and memory has passed. And the future generation, it doesn't mean anything to them. Like, and he gave me an example of like a guy who was like, he was like, he was like the only correspondence from an actor during the 1800s that's worth really anything these days is from John Wilkes Booth because mm. of, you know, he assassinated Lincoln. But, you know, he wasn't in any way one of the best actors of his day. He was just associated with this cross cutting, like, you know, forever indelibly like written, like etched into American history moment, a moment that, 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 that signifies that. And he was like, you know, uh, correspondence from the, the top actor of his day these days, he's like, I probably couldn't really sell it. I, I couldn't, I can't get that to sell these days. You know what I mean? Like that doesn't have the value because we just don't remember that time, you know? And so that's really interesting to think about too, because it's like, you have a whole new generation of people entering the NFT space. And I always say like, in the NFT space, Web3, weeks are months, months are years, like things move so fast. Um, so like, you know, we talk about like NFT archaeology and some people laugh because it's like the distant eras of 2014 <laughs> and 26, you know, like that. But like that's an eternity in this space. And like I know people like I have friends who got in in January, you know, you know, during the boom in January. And like to them, like they're learning everything from scratch. And it's like you know, to them, they're like, oh, like, like they, their thoughts on like who are OGs and things like that are different than like mine coming in in 2020 and and on all that. And that's only, you know, less than two years, but it's like, you know, it, there's still a very different mindset. And so that's also really interesting to think about too, is like, you know, when you look at these, you know, these, um, these artists, uh, it, it's interesting sometimes. Cause like you look at, for example, like X copy, I mean, X copy, it makes so much sense to me, like why he's like the crypto art blue chip, like so much sense. Um, but it's like, then you look at like a Euro Marone who was active during the same time has collected, who's, who's collaborated with X copy, um, who, you know, like it, you know, who's also an OG on super rare and the markets are so different. You know what I mean? It's like, and it's funny. It's like, there's just like people like, th like the, the new generation of people here, like don't necessarily know him, even though the OGs know him and like think about him in the same, in the same thing. And like, that's interesting. It'll be interesting to see if that changes. It'll be interesting to see if, um, you know, as, as this becomes more studied, documented academic for lack of a better term, like whether like the narratives change or whether, you know, um, it, it'll be, you know, like artists that have more of that, like current recognition, but I, I actually do love it because I do think that like, I love the fake rares project. I love, like, I love seeing artists like at like Alpha Centauri kid getting involved. Um, I love to see that like Jake, the DJ and like all of that, um, you know, because at the end of the day, the, these artists have new school followings who are gonna, it's going to cross their Twitter feed. They're going to say a fake rare. What's that? They're going to click in and then maybe they end up learning about rare Pepe's and then maybe they buy a rare Pepe one day. Like, here's the thing. Like, I remember this very like there, there's a it's funny to me, like all the parallels and you'll appreciate this coming from like with your love of dance music. But like I remember when like EDM, quote unquote, EDM was taking over America. That was like right at the time that I was like building Billboard Dance. And like my tastes personally were more in house and techno. Yeah, you know me, too, I mean? me like, too. Me too in trance. You know, I got 
Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, like to me, it's like, you know, it was like, I was like, okay. And like, there were a lot of people who were like, oh, like, you know, in that world who were like turning up their nose at like EDM and being like, this is, you know, this is not sophisticated music. This is not like, you know, this, this music is trash, like these blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, I was like, give it like two years and these kids are going to be like listening to deep house and techno and like they're going to be coming down that rabbit hole this is their gateway drug this is their entrance into this kind of music and sure enough like look at look at the popularity of artists like you know black coffee and like the richie Hawtons and the jamie joneses and the solomons of the world like you know and again like to, there are people who'd be like, those guys aren't underground at all, you know, because there's, there's always layers. Everything. Yeah. Right? Uh, that's it's so yeah, true, it's, dude. So true. But it's similar. It's similar. And so like, I actually welcome when I see some of these artists who have, you know, significant followings that, that, that are newer to the NFT space that uh, like showing the the flowers for the, for those who came before. And, and now like I think fake rares is like a really great project in terms of like bringing them in, um, and being a part of like this new wave of it. Um, and then you realize you're like, wait, like, it, you know, but it's, it's, it's a slippery slope. Like, you know, I, I remember it, it's, it's easy to remember, like, you know, when we, when we ourselves got into NFTs, like we had no idea about a lot of this stuff. We've learned so much in a pretty short amount of time, relatively speaking. And like a lot of the, like, not everyone, but a lot of, a lot of these newcomers will too. So it's all about like, it's all about like creating the opportunities for them to learn and discover more. And if that's a, you know, if that's a, a contemporary artist doing a fake rare and helping a kid understand rare Pepe's and is Googling it and he ends up finding our Joe Looney podcast and he listens to Joe talk about like the vision of it and all that. Awesome. Amazing. I'm, I'm very much here for that. That's, that's such a, a unique parallel. You could kind of see crypto generate it- the generations that you see in in the real world is generally like 15 years. You could kind of compare that to like a bear bull cycle in, in yeah. crypto, right? As the new generation. Yeah. And what what's the, the crypto meme is that uh, every new generation comes in and builds their new Ponzi and tears down the old one. <laughs> so, so you kind of have to go in and uh, make it suitable for these new people to come in with the people that they're familiar with. You mentioned that uh, Robness was uh, minting Tez Trash, right? He's the one of yeah. the founders of Trash Art, and now he's on these new platforms coming in and building it. And it's not a, an ego hit where some people, some of the OGs in all industries across the world, they'll want to participate in what the, the new platform is because they're the OG status and, and they're kind of above it. Totally. And you know, what's cool. I, I hit up Rob about it. Cause um, we're going to actually have him on an NFT now, uh, like Twitter space, you know, uh, to talk about test. He was like, he was like, actually he's like, these three and he like, he, uh, I don't have their Twitters in front of me, but it was three other active members of the trash art community. He's like, they're the ones who organized it. He was like, I actually had very little org- like involvement with the actual organization. I'm all fully in favor of it. I'm really excited about it. Obviously I've, I've participated in it greatly, but it was actually them that like drove this. And I was like, that makes me even more excited. Yeah. The fact that there's like all these, like, you know, and, and I, I don't know how long each of them have been in it. I think there are a couple of them are OG, but like the fact that there's like, you know, that this, this movement is bigger than one person and, and that there are people, you know, like there are, there are, there are others driving this forward and it's like that's that's a real movement right and and that's exciting to see and um and i think that's really cool that like you know he got behind it and i think it's like it's it was really special and like i had fun participating in it and i'm you know i think that's why i want to help give a platform to it on nft now because i think people should know and like that's that's like that's that's like that's heartening to me like that's healthy to see like that's like okay cool like this is bigger than any one person this is bigger than anything there and um that like we need to see more of that Mm -hmm. we need to see more of that like what 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 can galvanize a historical project like to bring new people in to also like and it's a little different when it's like more of like an art form movement than like a historical project and obviously like the v2s of different projects have had like you know like Mm -hmm. like quality varies like you know it's like it, it depends on how that all goes it's not always the right decision for a project to do that um but i do think that there's something to be said for figuring out ways and events and things to like galvanize people around um and 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 have that community do more than just like talk about the old times like how do we make that relevant to the new to the new generation yeah yeah this brings an interesting point which is uh 
the idea of utility. Uh, utility has been a meme or projects, the modern projects that have tried to dive into utility, everything's just kind of plummeted um, time and time again, yeah. right? Everyone wants to trade on speculation. But, but now when you look in the historical space, there's a few projects who have tried to take some of these modern properties and really drive innovation. Um, Crypto Schools has done it yeah. with, with the minting. Mooncats, the Ponder team is probably like the brilliant dev team out there who's done yeah. on-chain wearables. And it really hasn't like prescribed any additional value, but it has driven more community member or more people to buy it and just be a part of the community. Do you, do you think this is the right way for some historical projects? Or do you think when you view historical projects that they should just be something of a museum or once we move to web three, history is more than just something that we stare at. History is definitely more than something that we stare at, but you got to also uh, do right by the history. Do you know what I mean? Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that like launching a V2 is the right move for every NFT for historical NFT project. Uh, I, I, but I, I do think I do welcome like projects figuring like figuring out innovative ways of getting people involved. I, I like the I, I like the um I like the idea of like of keeping that original like genesis, whatever you want to call it, like the original historical project, like keeping that like keeping the cachet and like the, mm -hmm. the 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 like the mystique and the and the narrative around that while still making it relevant to like a new generation that's easier said than done mm -hmm. very much easier said than done um but i also think there's something really to be said for strengthening bringing new people into the community strengthening ties like you know, we, we joke about it. We joke about like Mooncats as like the stable. Yeah. <laughs> but like, it's actually pretty remarkable that like that it has stayed consistent at a time when other things have plummeted. And similarly, like, you know, I've so like my whole thing, like, like recently, I've just been like, I, I'm I like this bear market. I've been acquiring cur curio cards just yeah. because like, I'm just like, it, it's such a no brainer to me. Um you know, obviously, I don't know if I'll make it to a full set anytime soon because some of those, like some of those, you know, rare ones are pretty. Mm -hmm. But you know, but I'm 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 out here like like picking up, and and part of it was watching the markets, and I saw that like at a certain point, other things were falling further, and, and cards up. were staying right where they were. And yeah, like when ETH went up, the you know it would go a correspondingly, but they were hovering right around the same around like U.S. dollar value, and like I was like, cool, Curio cards have like hit their floor essentially, to hit their her bottom, and. I, I I think that like right now we have to remember that we are so early. It's so nascent. These communities, it's still so few people that are actually in this day to day trading NFTs, things like that. And so like, while, you know, Mooncat held it steady may be discouraging to someone who was hoping to see a crazy return from it. I actually think it's a very healthy thing for that project going forward. And, and, you know, strengthening community ties, you have to remember that it's like it there's depth and there's breadth, right? And like the depth is really important. Um, because it's like those community ties that keep people holding when when the things go down. And it's it's the true community that's going to attract new people when things go back up. And and like um there's you know, it's it's the distinction between like values-based communities and communities that are purely built around speculation and the shared hope for number to go up <laughs> and to hand off the bag. And the latter have no future. They just don't, right? Like there has to be something more to that. Um, and again, I'm uh, again, I I don't like I don't condemn anyone except for people who are bad actors and scammers and like you know and and liars and and people who are out there to um, rug pull or the like. But like I don't begrudge someone you know launching a, a legitimately launching a project and you know or or buying into a project and then flipping it. Like as I said, the flippers are an important part of the ecosystem. But I don't I wouldn't feel comfortable long term you know, having my like assets in, in projects that speculation is all they care about. Mm -hmm. That's that, that that's, it's going to, you know what I mean? Like that, that doesn't have any sustainability. Um, and so, you know, when, when I see, for example, um, a healthy community building around a project, even if it hasn't necessarily like had a tremendous impact on floor price, it, it, I still take note of that. And that's actually, I think a really good indicator for what's to come because remember like you know even at its peak what it was you know like you know when all of all of the insanity we saw in 2021 was like less than like what 1.5 million people yeah. trading on on a, was it that's tiny 
that's tiny. Like that is t- absolutely tiny. Like when you come, you think about like macro market penetration. So like, you know, it, I I think that like we we tend to overanalyze things like you know little like short term movements things like that when we're working with such a small like sample size right now. Um, and we have to remember to zoom out. Like I like one thing I always tell people is you know like when I bought Bitcoin in 2013, I thought I was late because the chart looked the same. You know what I mean? Like it looked like I could have gotten in here and I was like get buying up here. And yeah, I mean, I ended up buying the top of that market, but that, but the top of that market, I would kill to buy to pay that for it now. You know what I mean? Um, and so what, and then when you zoom out, that whole chart was a, t- is a tiny blip on the radar. Now it's going to be the same thing with NFTs in the projects that, that have staying power. Do you know what I mean? And in the overall, the overall, um, sales volume and market cap of like NFTs is going to follow a similar trajectory, you know, and, and what we're going to see come is going to dwarf what we've seen. And so when I see projects surviving and continuing to thrive, even if they're keeping it small, I'd be surprised if they were making it massive right now. You know what I mean? Like, it, like that's, that's about the best they can do right now um, is just to continue to like build those community ties. And like what I, what I think, I think what Ponderware has done with Mooncats is great. Like they've made it really fun don't don't like never underestimate the power of having fun yep that's never we've lot we've gotten away (laughs) we've gotten away from it in the mania and now uh now you see certain communities are actually having a lot of fun and now the historical community seems like it's a lot of fun yes there is some divides in terms of the semantics that people get lost and that that kind of won't go won't go away but when we do zoom out on the historical community um, there's assuming there's going to be more classifications that will be considered historical, right? We have, you have the PFP movement. And when you yep. look through all of history, um, on, on Namecoin, you kind of saw the beginning of tokenizing images through Twitter and then Bitcoin, you saw the birth of crypto art and gaming between spells of Genesis yep. and, and rare Pepe's. And then you move over to uh, Ethereum and that's when everything happens, right? You have crypto yeah. kitties with breeding, you have PFPs, which that wasn't the original intention. You have art. Is there, is there any other trends or like trends right now that are maybe small or m- maybe in the beginning stages that are going to be mega trends that uh, you see could have a, a, some sort of staying power within the historical collections? It's a really good question. So when we think about like, like his- historical is a relative term. The Beatles are historical in my eyes. But are they as like I, like so is George Washington, right? Obviously, George Washington is older. Obviously, George Washington is like a longer thing of history. But like to me, they're both historical, right? And to depending on who you are, one may mean more to you than the other. If you're not American, if you're if you're uh, uh, you know in the UK, like George Washington may not mean that much to you. But the Beatles, you know what I mean? Like and, and so what I what I, I think it's important to keep that in mind. So like, I remember seeing the debate is like, is Board Ape Yacht Club going to be considered historical? Of course, it's going to be considered historical. That doesn't mean it's crypto punks. That doesn't, nobody, we don't need them to be the same thing. Uh, you know, like we can appreciate these things for their own unique, like strengths, appeals, and how they're remembered in the history books. Is Board Ape Yacht Club historical right now? I wouldn't call it historical right now. It's contemporary, but it clearly has cultural significance that will translate to historical significance when we look back on the, on, on where we've, where we've come from and where we, where we're going, right? So so that's how I kind of think about these things when I'm like evaluating um, contemporary projects, historical projects. I, I'll give you a great example. Like I think cryptodes are going to be remembered very fondly by the history books because I think they were one of the first real like CCO projects to take off. Um, they uh, they were embraced by you know the. The, the, the space at large, especially really respected collectors. Um, you go to a lot of respected collectors galleries and you still see like the cryptodes in there, um, you know, and now you look at nouns and you look at like what, what that has, like the whole CCO movement um, ha- has given like, you know, to me like cryptodes, I, would, I, would I call them historical right now? No, you know, not enough time has passed necessarily, but they're definitely culturally significant. And I do think they'll be remembered as historically significant because CCO is turning into a movement that is bigger than, Punk four one five six is bigger than Gremlin, um, and and that's a good thing, you know, like that's a good thing, and and they'll be remembered as important figures in this, and uh, you know, so will six five two nine and all that, and, and like you know, like we're seeing that history getting written before our eyes, and that's one thing too that like I don't want to miss the forest for the trees, only focus on old things when like we have to remember that this is going to be remembered like as a renaissance period of sorts, you know, whether you want to call it, they're like, in some ways, like, it's funny, because people are like, Matt, like, 
you just said these are the cave drawings of the metaverse or are we is this the cave drawings or is it the renaissance i'm like it's both it's both you have to understand like what we're seeing right now is is going to be remembered as like an unmatched period you know when, when we look back on the history of all of this right like this is the first real boom in mainstream awareness i know there was crypto kitties and all that in 20 but like that was different like this this is this took it to a different level of mainstream awareness people is forever going to be in the history books uh you know associated with this uh you know and and we will look back on this time as a time of like insane change the artists that were it'll be interesting to see like who's remembered for what and all that um so we're seeing history written in front of our eyes and that's exciting. That's so exciting. And so to me, like, I don't really like I, I think you like it, people are missing the mark when they get all caught up in like, this is historical. This is not historical. Like at the end of the day, many of these things will be considered historical. That And, it, and it's not about like necessarily sometimes it'll be about which is older, especially when we're talking about firsts, you know, like that might matter really there. But I think a lot of it is going to matter with cultural significance, like, you know, like Crypt cryptodes may mean more to the CC adherence to the CCO movement in 50 years or whatever that looks like then than crypto punks do. And that's okay. You know, I'm not saying they're going to be worth more. I'm just saying like part of it is about values. And that's like when I get back to like the idea of values based communities, why those have staying power. Um, and so like, to me, it's like uh, the historical community needs to like stop like cannibalizing itself being like like arguing about like this this versus this i mean look historical record is important like facts are important i i get that setting the record straight is important but we have to also recognize that like it's not about being like my thing is more historical than yours my thing is that this it's like let's let's take a, a wide angle lens zoom out and understand that so many of these things are going to be considered historical in their own way um and that's why like to me it's it's like you know, when I look from my own like collection, I'm like, damn, like I need more curio cards because those just make so much sense. Like, I wish I had more crypto punks because that's just like, yeah, you know, like my crypto punk is like, that's like, that's that's an NFT that you know I would be good putting in a vault for 50 years, never touching, and feeling very confident that like it'll hold its value and increase in value in the future. You know, and and even again, as I even said, like even if it didn't it still has that historical significance to me that I like, that I just like love and respect about it. And that's, that's because of the values that it represents to me. You know, people can argue whether I'm right or wrong about those values. They could say crypto punks were manipulated, blah, 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 blah. Cool. But, but that's fine. There's always going to be a narrative. There's always a narrative, but I think, you know, to me, it's like when we look back on the history of this, um, there are projects that will be remembered for different things. And it's not, like even though the blockchain doesn't lie uh it's not simply going to dictate which ones are remembered for for just you know sp simply being older than another one isn't simply going to isn't going to be necessarily why one has uh, uh has has made a bigger impact in in cultural memory you know and so um that's just a perspective i try to apply and it, it is like such a crazy thing to be situated at this time i think it's an amazing opportunity for all of us it's one of the reasons why you know I'll be up till 4 a.m. like like registering name coin domains and yeah. you know and things like that. It's why I'll be like up till you know, like, like I've literally like, you know, just down the rabbit hole. That's that was how I stumbled upon crypto skulls, was literally just like researching and just like looking at old things on on this because I just I find it so fascinating. To, like how fortunate are we to be born right now? Mm -hmm. Like you know, like in in a generation's time, like all of these like truly historical assets from like these early eras are going to be in like, you know, they're not, they're, they're going to be out of reach right now. They're in reach. Like we, like, if you're listening to this right now, like, like, you know, like there's, there's no right or wrong necessarily, like find, like find a historical project that speaks to you and like, and like get involved with it. And like, you can actually like, like that, that was like, that was so, so exciting to me about crypto skulls was to see literally a new generation of people go in to this, because I remember going in the Crypto Skulls Discord, being like, "Is anybody?" Home? Like, you know, like, they're like, you know what I mean? Like, the, like prior to all that, and like, and there were like a few diehards in there, and I love that, and I love that they're still a part of it, and like all that, and and just look, some of them, some of them left, and we're just like, love it, like pass the torch, all that. A lot of them are still there, but like I remember going there, and all of a sudden, there's this whole new group of people who are in there and excited about it, and I was like, well. Crypto kind of showed me the potential. I was like, if, if that can happen here, it can happen, it can happen elsewhere too. And so 
you know, I encourage people to like, like I would say Web3 rewards people who show up. Like, you know, like, you know, the people who ended up leading Crypto Skulls, it's not like they like applied for the job. They like kind of just stepped up and like, like really started creating value. And like, and that's what I would encourage anyone to do in a community that they are aligned with. And, you know, I think like, like I love seeing like the diehards in the Mooncats community, you know, I love my Mooncats, yeah. you know, that, that was such a crazy time too. Like I will never forget being on an American Airlines flight, <laughs> uh, like like connected to like the worst Wi-Fi on earth. And like, like I saw Alan Henna tweet about the moon cats and my Wi-Fi cut out immediately. <laughs> like, and I was literally like, I'm refreshing. I'm like, I am stewing. The Wi-Fi was out for like 26 minutes. It was like the longest 26 minutes. And I'm literally like, I'm actually praying at this point, you know, and I'm not, I'm not somebody who normally prays. You know what I mean? Like, and, and it was so funny as I look around me and everybody is so oblivious. They're like, they have no idea. They don't have like <laughs> an inkling of like what's going on in my head. I was like, I need to reconnect to this internet so I can like and excavate some, cats, yeah. <laughs> some like historical cats from the distant era of like, you know what I mean? It's like, and, and then it popped back up and I was, and I was thankfully, I think I rescued five, a five, five moon cats, which is pretty good for American airlines, you know, like, <laughs> pretty Wi-Fi. but like, you know, it was just like, and, and that, that was like, so exil like those moments are like, that's, do you know what I mean? Like all of a sudden, like, like I'm talking nostalgically about that. And like that, that was the rediscovery of Mooncats. Like people have nostalgia that dates back to the early days of Mooncats. Like there's all, these are, these are the stories that like, these are the stories that we tell and, and the, and the significance of it. Like to me, like there's a, like those Mooncats, like, you know, they're, they're, they, re they remind me of a certain time in my own experience. In addition to the, their obvious historical significance, like they, they remind me of this like early period when it was just like, we're discovering like, you know, like that's the spirit of discovery. So like, you know, I, I just tell people, I'm like, a lot of people are like, what, like what historical NFTs should I buy? I'm like, look, like I'm never going to give anyone like financial advice, but like, I think like go towards the ones that like, that feel right to you and also feel like, like a piece of history, you know, like, and, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of different ones out there. And that's why, like, that's why I'm excited to see all the different projects and communities come together because at its core, it, it, like the appreciation for them kind of comes from the same place, which is like deep appreciation for how we got here and the pioneers that paved the way and like the early innovators and the people who had the imagination and the belief to be a part of this early. And like, that's, that's, that's a spirit that like we need more of, I think, as we continue to like build this next chapter. That beautifully well put the the lore is what keeps us attracted to the historical community and the members is, is what keeps us there matt incredible conversation there's still at least six or seven uh, questions i have in my head but maybe we'll have to save it for a round Let's two go. and a round we'll table a at some point sometime. part two sometime now really appreciate your time i know you're very busy um where can everybody find you what's the best place twitter and nft now yeah yeah twitter so uh on twitter first i'd recommend following nft now you know we are we are always uh um, you know, putting out guides, resources, articles, explainers, like we're really, um, you know, education is a huge part of what we're doing. Um, so you can find us on Twitter, Instagram at NFT now, uh, NFT now.com for our editorial, uh, our podcast, NFT Now podcast on, on YouTube and also any, any streaming provider. Um, and then for myself, it's, uh, it's at Matt Medved on, uh, on most web two, uh, <laughs> you know, socials and I had, it's at Medved on most of the web three ones. <laughs> oh, perfect. Got the surname. The ENS community would love right. that. Yeah. Yep. I, I appreciate you, Matt. Uh, I hope you have a good rest of your day. Um, I know we'll run into each other there sometime at one of these conferences or something like that. The historical community uh, is grateful for you and uh, thank you for the conversation. Thank you guys for listening and watching. We'll catch you next time. Bye.